Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome again to the new lecture of this course, Fundamentals and Applications of Dielectric Ceramics. So, let us just briefly recap what we did in the last lecture. So, in the last lecture, we discussed the details of dipolar polarization, we looked at the whole analysis, which is called as dipolar relaxation, and what we saw was that. Uh, uh, dielectric constant uh, through the whole analysis worked out as epsilon r prime is equal to epsilon r prime infinity plus epsilon r s prime minus epsilon r infinity prime divided by 1 over omega square tau square and epsilon r double prime was equal to omega tau divided by 1 plus omega square tau square into uh, epsilon r s prime minus epsilon r infinity uh, prime. So, epsilon r s prime is called as uh, basically the static dielectric constant and epsilon r infinity is called as high frequency dielectric constant and you can see that there is a dependence on frequency here. So, these are called as Dy equations as we saw and when you plot them together then epsilon r prime it goes from a value epsilon r s prime undergoes a relaxation before it converts into. So, this is epsilon r s prime, this is epsilon r infinity prime and this relaxation happens at a frequency specific frequency which is for which we say. So, it is better to plot omega tau because you can say that this happens at omega tau is equal to 1. Okay. And uh, this is where your uh, the and the epsilon r double prime undergoes a maxima at this point, and this is okay. So this is what the behavior is, and tan delta can be obtained from this as epsilon r double prime to epsilon r prime. So when you plot now, this process is temperature dependent because the relaxation time is a temperature dependent entity. So, when you make uh, for example, when you look at the variation of tan delta as a function of temperature, tan delta the tan delta and you plot the frequency uh, let us say at lower temperature this is the frequency at higher temperature it tends to show a rightward shift. So, this is how it will vary. So, this will be basically increasing temperature. So, the, the relaxation will occur at certain frequency, so, this is omega 1, so let, we can write it as omega, omega 2, omega 3 and the frequency will shift to right because the as we increase the temperature, the diffusion becomes faster as a result the relaxation times uh, slows down, one goes to uh, relaxation time decreases as you and, and the frequency you can do the relaxation at a faster frequency. So, this is generally the trend that you observe that the tan delta peak shifts to higher frequency as you increase the temperature and as a result there is a strong temperature dependence. So, when you plot you can also plot the for example, this maxima at which tan delta occurs. So, let us say you plot log omega max as a function of. So, this has a Arrhenius kind of behavior one can determine the activation energy from these plots. The maxima of these plots as a function of temperature will give you uh, uh, will give you a behavior which is basically omega is equal to omega naught exponential minus q a by k t. So, essentially one can determine what is the activation energy of migration uh, or dipole relaxation as a function of temperature uh, uh, when you do temperature dependent measurement of dielectric properties. So, this is a very useful uh, uh, so, when temperature dependent measurements of dielectric materials are very useful way to understand the intricacies of dielectric materials, the activation energy, what kind of defects you might have because activation energies are something which are these activation energies are signature of what kind of defects and processes are present in the materials. 
So, one can make very nice conclusions uh, about what happens in various different kinds of materials. So, now what we can what we should what we look at is we, we look at little bit uh, uh, more details of how do you characterize dielectric materials. So, for characterization of dielectric materials we need we need to define dielectric materials in a in a little bit electrical form. So, basically what we are going to look at from the characterization perspective now the how do you represent a dielectric material in a circuit form. So, dielectric material basically a electrical circuit representation. So, here because when you do characterization of dielectrics often you need to model the dielectric properties and when you do modeling of dielectrics this is uh, this is the modeling requires the material to be represented in the form of electrical circuit. So, uh, ideal dielectric material will have only capacitive contribution, but in a real life dielectric is hardly 100 percent capacitive as a result it tends to have resistances in it. So, how do you model those capacitors and resistances? Uh, for a dielectric. So, let us say uh, a perfect dielectric first take example of perfect dielectric. The perfect dielectric is basically modeled by an equivalent R C circuit. So, basically you have a capacitance C 1 which is in parallel to a capacitance C 2. So, this is a capacitance C 1, this is C 2 and this is in series with a resistance let us say R 2. Okay, so, this is an equivalent R C parallel circuit which is as, as it is called as. So, let us consider the first admittance of this uh, admittance is represented by y. Admittance is basically you can say z prime which is inverse of uh, impedance. So, one can write y is equal to 1 over z and this will be 1 over z 1 plus 1 over z 2 okay. and why this circuit has been chosen it will be, will also become a little clear as we go on. Okay. So, it is not all that coincidental it is a uh, it is not all that uh, uh, you know fluke there is there is a logic to it. So, we will see that in a little while. So, this y is 1 over z 1 plus 1 over z 2 and what is z 1? z 1 is for this one. So, here you only have a capacitance c 1. So, this will become 1 over i omega c 1 and what is z 2? z 2 will be 1 over i omega c 2 plus r 2 right. So, admittance can be written as i omega c 1 plus 1 over r 2 plus 1 over i omega c 2 all right. Now, considering in, in electrical circuit wherever you have resistances and capacitances the product of r c is taken as time constant. So, in this case let us say R 2 C 2 is equal to tau 2 which is time constant. So, again we can express the admittance as y can be i omega C 1 plus C 2 divided by tau 2 plus 1 over i omega Okay. So, here let us see what we have done. Yeah. So, we have taken C here. So, this we have made this as C 2 R 2 removed C from here and we have taken C on top. Okay. So, this will become like this alternatively we can write this as omega square tau 2 C C 2 plus 1 over omega square tau 2 square plus i omega into 
c1 plus c2 divided by 1 plus omega square tau 2 square. So, if you simplify this, you will get this expression that is omega square tau 2 c2 divided by 1 plus omega square tau 2 square and uh, plus i omega into c1 plus c2 divided by 1 plus omega square tau square. Now, you relate this to dielectric constant. So, what is this admittance is equal to 1 over z and this is related to dielectric constant as epsilon double prime plus i epsilon prime into omega c naught divided by epsilon naught. This is the that we did last time the frequency dependence of dielectrics and this is basically nothing but epsilon r double prime plus i epsilon r prime into omega c naught. You can express this in another form, you can if you multiply this by i. So, this will become minus i omega c naught into epsilon r prime minus i epsilon r double prime and this is what is basically epsilon r star right the complex form of uh, the electric constant. So, we can express this in this form. So, y can be represented as epsilon r double prime plus i epsilon r prime into omega c naught. Now, if you compare this with our the equation that is shown in the previous page uh, sorry previous line. So, this y and this y you compare just match the real and imaginary part and you will get the values of static and the, impedance, the real and imaginary dielectric constants. So, what we will get is for epsilon r prime we will get c 1 divided by c naught plus c 2 divided by c naught into 1 over 1 plus omega square tau 2 square and epsilon r prime double prime will be c 2 divided by c naught into omega tau 2 divided by 1 plus omega square tau 2 square. Now, this is very similar to what we saw earlier. Earlier we said that omega epsilon r prime is equal to epsilon r s r infinity prime plus delta epsilon which is basically static minus infinity low frequency minus high frequency divided by 1 plus omega square tau square. So, if you imagine this equation, if you remember this equation and compare this with. So, basically c 1 by c naught is nothing but your C1, your C1 by C0 is nothing but epsilon r infinity prime okay. and C2 is the difference between the two the epsilon r s prime minus epsilon r infinity prime. So, that is what it, this equation is. So, basically your C2 has turned out to be epsilon s minus epsilon infinity into C0 and c 1 is nothing but epsilon infinity. So, c 1 represents the high frequency dielectric constant and c 2 represents the difference between static and high frequency and that is why this circuit is not a fluke because this circuit gives rise to exactly the same equations that we derived using the y equations. So, this is the equivalent R c circuit model for a perfect dielectric which means which follows the Debye behavior. What happens when we do not follow the Debye behavior then there is a, a deviation. So, when you do not follow Debye behavior then what happens is that your relaxation times you do not have a unique relaxation time you have multiple relaxation time. So, as a result this equation gets modified as the Debye equations get modified as epsilon r infinity epsilon r star minus epsilon r infinity prime divided by epsilon r s prime minus epsilon r infinity prime and this is equal to 1 over uh, 1 plus i omega t to the power 1 minus alpha. So, this is modified equation and this was done by gentleman called as Cole Cole. Okay. So, here instead of so, here alpha is a parameter whose value will determine whether it is ideal or not ideal parameter. So, alpha did alpha is equal to 0 will mean 
your system is ideal device system. And deviation from alpha would mean that your system is so alpha greater than 0 would mean your system is non ideal in nature. And what it means is that basically alpha represents the distribution of relaxation times in the material and what it means is that you have different defects responding to different frequencies as a result you have multiple uh, so uh, relaxation times. So, distribution of relaxation times. So, if you plot now for example, epsilon r double prime versus epsilon r prime you should ideally get a semicircle like this and the frequency goes in this direction. So, this is a this is for a ideal dielectric, but in reality you will see that your semicircles are hardly obtained you obtain suppressed semicircles or raised semicircles which means you have some values of alpha which means material does not have a single relaxation time or single single entity uh, single single dipole rather it has uh, multiple defects which which respond differently to different frequencies as a result causing a variation in alpha. So, now let us look at let us build upon this semicircle what is the use of this semicircle well the use of this semicircle lies in what we call as technique called as impedance spectroscopy. So, impedance spectroscopy is a technique which is used to so impedance spectroscopy is a technique which is used to characterize dielectric materials. So, you saw that admittance is related to electric constant as a result the impedance is also related to the electric constant right. So, impedance and admittances are related to the electric constant. So, when you measure impedance you should also when the dielectric constants plot show the semicircles you should also get the similar semicircles in the plot of impedances and impedances are measured on equipments called as LCR meters or impedance analyzers. and there are various uh, companies which make them. So, uh, I am not going to advertise for any particular company, but uh, so these are the equipments which are used for varying. Uh, so, essentially um, you can say that intercepts of if you take the intercept of semicircle as we saw last on x axis that would be basically. Uh, so, we saw that epsilon r prime double prime and epsilon r prime shows a semicircle right like this. The intercepts are basically, so this is uh, you can say and the frequency varies like this. So, this is low frequency intercept. So, this is epsilon r infinity and this is epsilon r s. So, the low frequency, so this is prime let us say in this case real part. So, the low frequency intercept is epsilon r s r infinity and the high sorry this should be s not r. This is low frequency this is other way around. So, the low frequency should be the static dielectric constant and the high frequency intercept of a ideal semicircle should be the high frequency dielectric constant and the maxima of semicircle will occur at omega tau equal to 1 or you can say omega r c is equal to 1 in this case r 2 c 2, but and this should follow the semicircle equation. So, the semicircle equation would be and these plots are also called as they are called by different names Cole Cole plots or Nyquist plots and so on and so forth. So, the equation of semicircle would be epsilon r prime omega minus half of epsilon r s prime plus epsilon r infinity prime to square plus ok. 
okay this is the equation of semicircle so if you google let us say what is equation of semicircle you will find similar form of equation semicircle so you will have so if you if you take different values like y minus something square is equal to something else square plus 1 over another factor square so this is the equation of semicircle which is basically obtained by removing omega tau from the equations that we have derived earlier so we derived the equations for uh, let's see which equations were these yeah so we derived the equations for uh, the electric constants so essentially we derived equations for epsilon r prime and epsilon r double prime if you remove omega tau from these equations remove omega tau if you remove omega tau this is what you should get okay the variation of uh, the electric constant so this is as a function of frequency right we had the equation so if you remove omega tau this is what you should get which is the equation of a semicircle so let's do a little bit more with this and before we so when you plot epsilon r prime versus epsilon r double prime to prime let us say we get the semicircle okay so the semicircle uh, essentially the frequency increase is shown in the inverse direction from right to left and uh, let us say if you want to measure at this point so the, the electric constant will be so this would be epsilon r star a net electric constant so within this you will have this as x and this as y okay and now using these x's and y's you can write the equation of semicircle right and here this would be epsilon r infinity this would be epsilon r s and this is basically nothing but c1 divided by c0 and this is nothing but c1 plus c2 divided by c0 okay so a perfect electric so this would be the case for a perfect electric where you can calculate x's and y's and you can find out at this point this will be omega tau is equal to 1. So, x's and y's and the difference between this so essentially you will have x square plus y square is equal to this, this square right. So, this will be a 90 degree angle right for a perfect semicircle this would be 90 degree as a result x square plus y square would be diff square of epsilon r s prime minus epsilon r infinity prime okay. So, this would be the you can see x square plus y square is equal to epsilon r s prime minus epsilon r infinity prime square and if you look at the previous equation this is what you have this is you can say some sort of x square this is y square the 4 will go of course on the other side this is what it is right. So, what you should obtain for a perfect dielectric is like this a semicircle but for a real dielectric often what you see is that you have these sort of upturns like these and these are when you see these upturns basically you have high losses in the material material is lossy it has defects it has other things which give rise to these kind of losses and this is something this is something that that is a problem okay and uh, so when you model this now in, but in a real material you hardly see one semicircle in a real material the situation can be a little bit more complex you might have a situation in which so you plot epsilon r double prime to epsilon r prime and you might have situation like so sorry so will have one semicircle you will have another semicircle which is sort of overlapping this you may have another so it could be something like that then you may have another semicircle which is overlapping this so eventually you will obtain a plot which will look more like this something like this and this is what you have to model you have three semicircles here and these may not be perfect semicircles okay so may not be perfect semicircles so you need to 
make appropriate models for them. For example, let us say if you have in a system polycrystalline system you have a grain contribution, you have grain boundary contribution and then you have some other interfaces I write like electrode interfaces and things like that. So, grains generally respond at higher frequencies, grain boundaries require at little lower frequencies and this is increase in omega and interfaces will respond at another frequency. So, it is possible that you have one impedance for this system, another impedance for this system, another impedance for this system and then you also have to take care of contact resistances in the system R C and this Z may be it is like this or it could be series of something like this. There are various possible circuits which are possible depending upon the nature of defects. So, as a result this is far more complicated. So, what generally we do as a scientist is that we measure in, in the impedance spectroscopy we first measure impedances okay. convert these impedances. So, from these impedances we make plots of you know real. So, similarly when you when you make a plot of z double prime to z prime you should also get these semicircle like. So, you should have these kind of semicircles as we saw earlier and we make plots of z double prime versus frequency z prime versus frequency to determine the transition to determine where the maxima is occurring how they are behaving and things like that and you make these plots from these plots you determine what is the resistive contribution. So, you separate out the resistive and capacitive contributions from these different semicircles you find out for different components. So, if you have let us say two semicircles you will have for one R 1 C 1 and for another one you will have R 2 C 2 and so on and so forth. So, you differentiate between different relaxation times, different resistances and then you also make temperature dependent measurements. To distinguish clearly between the grain and grain boundary contributions for example, the activation energy for grain will be different the activation energy for the grain boundaries will be different. So, as a result when you plot the relaxation times as a function of frequency or temperature there is a possibility in some cases you will have uh, distinct behaviors. So, at high temperature you may have this activation energy at low temperature you may have this activation energy and these will correspond to different entities one may correspond to grain another may correspond to grain boundaries and so on and so forth. So, doing temperature dependent and then of course, uh, not only you can make z prime versus z double prime, z double prime versus z prime or z double prime versus frequency or z prime versus frequency plots, you can also calculate a quantity called as electrical modulus. Electrical modulus is called as m which is related to z okay. and then using electrical. So, the, 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 pro, the, the problem with z double prime is that high frequency contribution in, in the impedance in the in impedance spectroscopy when you plot z double prime versus z often you will see that high frequency contributions are little subdued, but when you make contribution when you make measurements of m double prime versus m prime the high frequency contributions are more explicit than the low frequency contribution and this is because of the correlation between the two properties. So, you measure impedance you measure elect you analyze electrical modulus from impedance, do a temperature dependent analysis and find out the contribution from entities such as uh, grains, grain boundaries and find out difference between the two. So, impedance spectroscopy is a very powerful technique to analyze materials unfortunately it is not the focus of the course, but there are several papers for example, there is a book on impedance spectroscopy by Ross Macdonald. And there are very good review papers written. Uh, on impedance spectroscopy of dielectric materials. So, I would I would ask you to go through them and read about the details of impedance spectros spectroscopy, how it could be useful in characterizing dielectric materials. So, we will stop here today 
Uh, in the next lecture, we will uh, we will talk about dielectric uh, failure uh, breakdowns and failures, and then we will move on to non-linear dielectric materials. So, thank you very much.